Welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Candidate Forum. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. There are three Republicans who've announced that they'd like to be the next state treasurer for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. However, only one of them will emerge from the May 16th primary. Today, CPC is hosting its Candidate Forum, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Andrew Cooperider, one of those candidates for state treasurer. Andrew, welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so this is your opportunity to make the case to voters across the Commonwealth as to who you are, why you're running, and mm -hmm. what you would do if you became Kentucky's next state treasurer. So let's start out in the beginning. Why? Uh, tell us about your background. Sure, tell sure. Your family, work history, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, um, well, I'm a, I'm a husband and father. Um, I have an 11-year-old son and a wonderful wife, Kara. And I'm also a small business owner. So uh, I, I have three main companies. I employ uh, dozens of Kentuckians, depending on how I feel that day, between 30 and 40. I'm just joking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, we employ between 30 or 40 um, employees. And, and we, you know, we built that business from scratch. Uh, my wife and I started that business with just $3,000. Um, and, and we really built it into something today. So that's certainly some experience and, and background kind of to do with that. I think as so well, tell us, I'm sorry to interrupt. Tell us about that business. Is that yeah. the coffee shop? In no, there? no. Um, our, our first business was a commercial cleaning company, still in business today. Mm -hmm. Um, and we owned, uh, two restaurants when COVID hit, but, um, Brood was the only one left, you okay. know, because we had to shut down one during that time. And then I also own a software engineering and, and tech development company, too, as well. Okay. Okay. And you're from Lexington? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I've lived in Lexington since I was, you know, 14, 13, 14 or so. Um, you know, my family moved there for work. Uh, I, my family originally comes from the Appalachians of Ohio, so southeastern Ohio, that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, I spent some time uh, in Ohio, and then I, I've spent more than half my life here, and I guess my main growing up here. So I guess you could say I grew up in, in Lexington, but okay. yeah. It's, so it's home. It's, it's home, home for you, right. uh, your wife, and your 11-year-old son. Um has your background prepared you to be the next state treasurer? Well, I think the number one thing about, you know, first off, when we go into my background of actually having to manage funds, you don't accidentally become uh, successful in small business. You got to know how to manage dollars, manage people, and also solve problems in unique ways. What we see so much in our government is people who just know how to solve problems by throwing money at it. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to bring is state treasurer, somebody who can solve problems uh, not just by throwing money at it, but also being able to look at things and say, um, how can we deal with this situation? Or maybe, is this a situation we even should be dealing with? Is this government's role? Uh, somebody to kind of bring in that common sense. And, and on top of that too as well, and um, I think as your viewers would probably remember me best from the stand I took with my coffee shop brood that you mentioned uh, three years ago, um, where we refused to shut down the face of Bashir's mandates the shop there in Lexington. But, and, and I know you know this from working alongside me, I've been very active in the legislature as far as uh, on activism roles about some of these issues, uh, writing and, and some legislation that's actually passed too as well, um, some amendments as well. So th those types of things where we fought on some important issues, understanding that process, and then also as well, um, a background suing Bashir. I'm the only candidate in this race that sued Bashir before I'm in the, and, and won too. I've won several times. And that's incredibly important because we see Bashir just filed another lawsuit against the treasurer's office last week. So, you know, we need somebody who knows how to, to navigate government as a whole, whether that's legally through the courts, whether that's through the legislature, through activism, or also somebody who just understands how to spend money. <laughs> I mean, so many people only know how to spend other people's money. They don't know how to manage it when they actually have to sign the payroll checks themselves. You know, I'm the only candidate in this race that kind of brings that to the table. Tell us about some of your political influences or life influences, Andrews, that have helped shape your um, thinking on the issues and on public service. Um, well, if, if I have to say, if you're to ask my number one thinker that kind of has shaped my, my life, uh, I'd say Zig Ziglar. Um, I listened to Zig Ziglar a lot growing up. Uh, there was a point in my life where I was kind of at an inflection point where I could go bad or good. Mm -hmm. And I listened to Zig Ziglar's How to Stay Motivated probably like 20 times. Okay. Um, I listened to that a lot. 
uh, when I was about 20 years old. And so mm -hmm. that really shaped me moving forward. And then um, when you go into, as far as my view on politics uh, and, and my view on things, I look at, there's some thinkers like Ayn Rand, like Rothbard, that, that I agree with some of what they say, Hayek, some of what they say. But then at the same time, I have to balance that with the biblical principles that comes with being a Christian. Okay. Um, and so I, I would, I would, I, I, it sounds cheesy, mm -hmm. but if I didn't say I was heavily influenced by the Bible and, mm -hmm. and the way I think about things, I'd be lying. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd have to say that as well. So you're active in church in Lexington? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Uh, New Life Baptist is where I go. Okay. Very good. Uh, so what distinguishes you from the other two candidates running in the treasurer's primary on the Republican side? Well, I, I, several things. First mm -hmm. off, um, I'm the only person who's had uh, the quote unquote buck stop with them with the department the size of the treasurer's office before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both my opponents have either managed only a handful of people or have never themselves been in charge of those important decisions you have to make with the department. Mm -hmm. Direction you're going to go into, roles and responsibilities, uh, employment decisions, setting compensation. It, it's important that we have somebody that has actually done that before and done it with their money so they're not using the taxpayers to learn it. Mm -hmm. But I think as well, one of the very important things is a track record. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, um, I, you know, my track record is is such, and, and people can Google it and they can see that uh, when it's hard, I've stood up on the issues. And, and that's important when it comes to the treasurer's role um, as well, that somebody can stand on the issues. But uh, before it was politically popular, I'd stand on issues and I'd fight. Mm -hmm. um, I think for, you know, for my opponents, I think that, and I have two, mm -hmm. you know, i would characterized one as fighting for the other side for the last several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them, I don't know where he's been around there. Um, he's, he, I certainly didn't know much about him until I started running against him. So I know he's been on the front lines with us, but I, I think that really sets it apart is somebody who's not just words, but actions okay. and, and actions don't conflict with the words that I'm saying. Sure. So tell us your understanding of the um, position of state treasurer. What is the duty of the treasurer? Tell, tell us what, um, what, what you see that as being. Yeah, so the, the role of the state treasurer constitutionally, according to our state constitution, is to ensure our money is spent both legally and constitutionally correct. That's its number one priority. That's its number one mandate, right? And then it has other roles and responsibilities that are as prescribed to it by the legislature. That's what our constitution says. And so that has uh, the, the categories that that's really fallen into for the treasurer is lot property, uh, lottery pensions, um, and, you know, some other tidbit like, uh, um, you know, financial literacy that has fallen in, but that's at the, at the will and mandate of the legislature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we got to focus on what the constitution says first. And the constitution says, that's your number one rule. Make sure that your dollars are not used to infringe on your rights mm -hmm. and make sure they're not uh, breaking the law in their spending. Okay. So a couple of years ago, there was a Republican candidate for state treasurer. It's actually more than a couple of years ago. It may have been 20 years ago. I believe it was Linda Greenwell who campaigned uh, to abolish the office. Yeah, she was saying yeah. that she would abolish it because she didn't see that as um, necessary anymore. What are your thoughts on abolishing that office? Well, you know, every time I hear that, I always say this. I say any off, we, it's not a useless office. We've just had a lot of useless people. Um, I mean, it's been Democrats up until Allison since 1933. Um, and so, yeah, we would think the Secretary of State's office is useless and can be put into a cabinet position. We think the auditor's office is useless. The ag commissioner's office is useless. And we just become an ag or, or could just become a, a cabinet position underneath the governor if we're not electing people who are actually doing the job of that office. I think it also shows a whole, not a whole lot, but a, a lot of naiveness mm -hmm. about understanding how government works. So the pitch behind that is always, well, it's going to save us money. Mm -hmm. Do we believe, first off, you know, in the treasurer's office, there's about 35 employees, 25 of them are merit employees. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that, let's say we abolish the office, 25 employees are just switching over to the new one. Mm -hmm. So that's really only 10 employees. That's a million, a million and a half a year in salary. Maybe you're saving by abolishing it. Mm -hmm. Do we honestly believe government's not just going to spend that money elsewhere? it's not going to end up back in the taxpayer's pocket. So instead, if we have a state treasurer who's actually going to use that unique nuts and bolts access to the budget like I will, 
in order to seek out and find wasteful spending, not necessarily legal or unconstitutional, but wasteful and out of control spending and refer that to the legislature. That office could be saving the taxpayers tens of millions of dollars a year if it's used properly. But we can't do that for putting it under the governor because, well, the governor's not going to check himself. He's not going to check. You know, if they think it's a good idea to spend that money, they're going to spend that money. It's only the treasurer who can be that independent because they're elected from the governor, from the rest of government to come in and, and provide a preventative role as well. I mean, every other department reacts to overreach, reacts to overspending. The treasurer is the only one who can come in and stop it before it happens. What you're describing sounds a lot like the role of the state auditor, where they go into public, various public agency accounts or other public entities to review where the money's been spent and to make sure it has been spent uh, within the confines of... So, so auditor responds after the fact. The treasurer is the only one who can prevent it. The money is already spent when the auditor comes in. Your rights have already been violated. They've already not followed the law. The treasurer is the only one who can come in and say, look, this, before you spend that money, this is a wasteful expenditure. We're not gonna, we're not gonna put that forward. So is if, there... you, if it's an illegal or unconstitutional. Now, when it comes to what I'm talking about, about identifying waste and referring that to the legislature, the auditor doesn't do that. The auditor finds illegal expenditure. They make sure the books balance, but they're not coming in and looking at things like, um, for example, we spent $1.5 million last year uh, to create a health and equity dashboard to track racism and bigotry in healthcare. And that was funded by Cabinet of uh, uh, Health and Family Services. I believe that's wasteful. And so uh, we don't have anybody looking at those kinds of things and saying to the legislature, hey, before you give them $20 million more next year, you should see how they're just wasting your money on things that they, it's not illegal, it's not unconstitutional, but they just shouldn't be spending money on it. Auditor's not looking at that, treasurer's not, nobody's looking at that right now. And that's something I wanna to bring to the table. So are there people in the treasurer's office right now? Cause what I'm hearing is I, I hear the term watchdog. I, you mentioned the term constitutional spending. Um, so are you just talking about alerting um, the legislature or maybe the governor's office to spending that's not wise or constitutional? Are you talking about veto power over some of these? So if it's illegal or unconstitutional, the treasurer has veto power. Okay. The treasurer has the ability so, to say, I will not write this check. It is illegal or unconstitutional. Has that ever happened before? Yes. We had a state treasurer that refuses to sign their name on a check. Yeah. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay. Allison's done it a few times um, uh, with a few different things. Um, as far as like, so if you go into illegal, mm -hmm. there's a situation where somebody was trying to spend taxpayer funds to build a deck onto their backyard, right, to put a deck on their house. And so saying, hey, um, well, that's illegal. I'm not writing those checks. And so, you know, that's some examples, but um, it can be taken. I'll give, give an example of spending that's going on right now. Okay? And, it, and it's something I happen to know about because I'm involved in it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But a few, over the last uh, two budgets, our legislature has said that Bashir cannot expend more than $5,000 enforcing COVID mandates, okay? As a, as a check and a limit. Um, since then, he has spent tens of thousands of dollars through the ABC uh, uh, just enforcing um, licensing seizures on me from COVID mandates. And I know I'm one of about 600 uh, restaurants and convenience stores uh, that facing the same kind of retaliatory action due to COVID mandates. And so that is being funded by our dollars. That is an illegal expenditure of money. Uh, the state treasurer should be coming in and saying, well, hold on, I can't write these checks because the, the legislature specifically forbade you from spending money on this. Um, and then we're also seeing that too as well now with empowering the treasurer's office on this ESG issue. Um, the treasurer saying we're going to divest and not do business with companies that forward ESGs. And it's their job to say, I can't write a check to this company because that violates our laws. What is your philosophy, Andrew, in working with other elected leaders, whether it's legislators or other executive branch agencies or executive branch agencies? When you, for example, if you found unconstitutional spending or something that was wrong, what would be your approach to taking action if you were elected treasurer? Would you inform the others? Would you work to educate the others in positions of authority that are relevant to that? So it's it's about getting it addressed, not grabbing headlines. Mm -hmm. And so the first, and if we actually want to get something addressed, mm -hmm. the best way to do it is by approaching those mm -hmm. who have been interacting with it behind closed doors saying, hey, look, mm -hmm. these are some issues we're seeing. 
let's talk about this. Let's try to get this addressed. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you immediately just run out there and, and create a headline, not only does that, um, one, it could be simple oversight on their part. They could not know what's going on and now, now it's making them look bad. And so their natural response is to now be uh, uh, maybe overspending that they would agree they shouldn't be doing. Well, now they're gonna have to try to defend that because they're, they're defending their own actions. So if we're actually trying to get it done, it is important to go to uh, these individuals uh, who's ever in charge of that specific spending, whether it's the governor, whether it's the ad commissioner, whether it's the auditor, whether it's the secretary of state and saying, hey, look, we're seeing this spending on these items. Can, can we talk about how you're doing this? Um, and I think that's an important step to do before we go necessarily uh, um, publicly calling it out because it's much harder to get it addressed when we start bringing politics into it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't think that should deter us from doing what's right and what's what's wrong. And, and we need to do what's right and fight against what's wrong. And so talking about that behind closed doors is important. But at the same time, if something is, is wrong, we have something, like I said, going on where we're spending money on this kind of critical race theory, diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, mm -hmm. calling that out and saying, hey, giving them an opportunity to address it, but if they don't want to address it, the taxpayer still deserves to know that we're spending money on, on these kinds of items. You had just mentioned ESG. A lot, some of the viewers and listeners know what it is, some don't, but you had mentioned in our candidate questionnaire that you will prioritize, if you were elected treasurer, to not do business with ESG companies. Can you explain what ESG is yeah. and why they're harmful to Kentucky? Yeah, sure. So ESG stands for environmental and social governance. Mm -hmm. um, what it is, is they're attending to create a profit margin for behaviors that otherwise, or profit incentive, sorry, for behaviors that otherwise wouldn't have a profit incentive. So right now in a stock market, um, stocks are, of course, speculatory, and, and you're mainly trading based upon their balance sheets, their profit and loss sheets, you know, what their expected growth is, market conditions. Mm -hmm. um, what they're attempting to do is to grade a, a company based upon um, how environmental, so green energy, are they fossil fuels, those kinds of things. S is social. Do, do they have enough LGBTQ people, minorities? What's their gender makeup? Uh, how diverse are they? And then um, G, which is which stands for governance. And what that is, is your potential to have government come in and regulate you. Um, so this is, I look at this mainly as something that they're targeting at like social media companies mm -hmm. to say, well, if you don't take down that post at a mild suggestion from government and you're risking now government passing a law on you, then your, your, your ESG score will drop. So it's in your best interest. So all those behaviors I'm talking about though are, are, negate profits. Mm -hmm. So if you behave concerning about those things, you would actually be punished in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So they're attempting to create a profit incentive to get companies to behave in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and the ways we see this uh, substantively uh, here in Kentucky is, well, one, the E, we have coal industry, we have the fossil fuel industry here as well. And, and so that damages the ability for jobs that can't get funding for that. Um, and that that is negative to Kentucky's economy. The S side of things, social, I, I'll give you a perfect example of, of where we got an issue right now in Kentucky. The, our state bank is Chase Bank. Mm -hmm. As soon as Roe v. Wade was overturned, Chase Bank came out and said, we will fly and transport any of our employees that want to get an abortion out of state to get it. So we hold between five to seven billion at a time with this bank, generating them probably around 80 to $100 million a year in profits. Mm -hmm. Money then they're turning around and using mm -hmm. to transport unborn Kentuckians out of state to be murdered. Mm -hmm. That is our tax dollars funding abortions. Mm -hmm. And that's on the that's just a, a, a small part of the asset. I mean, the NASDAQ right now, they're in court fighting it, but they want to require every single company that, that trades on their market, on their board, to have at least one minority, uh, one woman, and one LGBTQ person on it. Mm -hmm and creating those kinds of hiring quotas, not based upon somebody's skills, but based upon either immutable characteristics or mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, and I think that's really damaging when the people sitting on our boards, three of them in this case, unless I guess you find a black transgender woman, then maybe you could check it all with one person. I'm not sure how they're looking at that, but anyways, um, not based on their skill, not based on their ability, not based upon their ability to create returns for their investors, but based upon simply what they look like. 
I and think, in other words, about interrupt identity politics. Identity politics, saying. yes, and and that will lead to uh, underperforming companies. Um, not only that, but we're also it's it's funding social engineering that is literally destroying our youth. We have the most depressed generation of children in America's history, mm -hmm. and we are continuing mm -hmm. to push forward. Not we, but they're continuing to push forward these social engineering ideas, and it is literally killing them. And we've got to fight that. On your website, Andrew, you indicate that fixing the state pension system would be your top priority if elected treasurer. How did we get to the place where the state pension system has um, been seriously underfunded? And then what's your proposal to fix it in your capacity as state treasurer? Yeah, so um, how we got here. So a few things. One, hiring people we should never hired. If we can't afford their pensions, we shouldn't have hired them. But putting that to the side, um, really you got to rewind to Steve Bashir, Annie Bashir's uh, dad. So um, understand Kentucky is a balanced budget state. What that means is, is we cannot pull out loans as a state. And so what we do, is, is but our, our pension obligations are not considered a part of that balanced budget. And so what happened was, is Steve Bashir had all these pet projects he wanted to do. And so rather than fulfilling the pension obligations, he then went ahead and did all of his pet projects. Now at the time, it didn't appear to be as big of an issue because we were getting good returns on our pension, the stock market was doing well, everything else. Well, then the financial crisis hits. And now all the times that Steve Bashir has been not throwing money into the pensions comes back to haunt us. Because the, as anybody knows who, who does investments, you don't realize a, a loss on a stock until you sell it. But our pension system has to constantly be selling and buying stocks because they have to constantly be paying out to beneficiaries. So they could maybe hold for six months, maybe a year, but as it extends on, they're gonna take, have to take that loss. Um, in order to be able to pay the benefits out to their to their uh, recipients. And so um, we end up selling a, a bunch of stocks at a loss, and that puts us behind to where right now we have the lowest percentage-wise funded uh, pension in the country. At 50, only 52% of our obligations are funded. Um, we have the lowest projected rate of returns on our pension in the country at 6%. And top of that, we keep sealing, seeing uh, um, embezzlements and, and, and frauds. We saw another one over this past year, uh, a $10 million embezzlement out of the state pension fund. I don't know if you heard about that, um, involving Crimmer Park West and, and, and Crumball Properties, and there's a whistleblower lawsuit. And so, you know, we're seeing these issues. Um, so how do we fix it? Well, understanding how our pensions are managed. They're managed by individuals who are elected by pension recipients. And so these, the, and, and in order to be on the board, you also have to be a pension recipient. So a lot of times we end up things like, you know, police officers or teachers, if it's a teacher's pension or highway workers or, or what have you, and, and good people, well-meaning people that care, but they have no financial back. And now the, the legislature has been trying to make it a mandatory thing to go through a, a financial training for those board members. So that way they can't be taken by, for a ride by all these hedge fund managers coming in and telling them whatever they think they want to hear in order for them to continue. Um, but what the treasurer can do is come in and, and offer a, not mandatory because we can't make laws, but uh, an optional uh, financial training boot camp for these board members to go through. So they can't continue to be taken by for a ride. Make sure that that training is not biased. Make sure it's not put together by one head fund or one bank or this have you, but, but have a lot of different experts, even competing experts that compete for the state's pension business coming in and, and doing these types of presentations on items. So that way our, our fund managers can ask questions uh, to who our, our boards can ask questions to our fund managers. So they can get a real good handle on what's going on. The other thing the treasurer can do is be screaming from the rooftops about how our pension problem is not going away mm -hmm. and it has to be addressed. And we can't just hope and wish that our population goes up by a million more people mm -hmm. as a plan mm -hmm. to deal with our pension, which right now that seems to be the plan. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need a treasurer who's willing to say, look, this is an obligation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we made this promise to these employees. We have to pay it. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. um, we should have never hired them if we couldn't do this, but we, we hired them and now we have to do this. 
and we can't be wasting money in all these other places. We have a real problem here that has to be addressed, and the treasurer can can address that. Would you suggest, Andrew, that part of the solution to the pension crisis is to uh, prevent the early retirement? Um, it used to be 27, 28 years of service, mm -hmm. and then uh, people could start drawing from that, whereas other states require at least a minimum age 60 years old or so until they start drawing. Kentucky has not been that way. Fairly minimal number of years of service to, to be fully vested and to be able to begin to withdraw from that retirement plan. Um, would you suggest changes in that aspect? Um, you know, I, I, to push back a little bit on that premise, mm -hmm. you said, you know, let's, you can look at your military. Mm -hmm. Our military, after 20 years, you can get a pension there, mm -hmm. right? Now, obviously, that's a lot harder work <laughs> um, than most of our state jobs, I believe, right? Um, but I, I think what people have to understand is pushing back the retirement age, all these things, it has to do with the fact that we're bad at managing the money, period. And so I understand the problem in front of us, but that problem was created by us, the government, uh, not managing the money properly. I mean, I mean, look at how much a pension cost us and look at the amount of time. And if you put that to a privatized 401k, you would end up retiring with a million dollars. Now, why, and, 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 and you could then put that into a money market, uh, receive five to 6% a year and easily live off that while not even touching the million dollars and then be able to pass that on to your children when you pass away. Not only are we paying out benefits that are less than that to, to a lot of people, mm -hmm. but also as well, we don't, they don't have a million dollars to pass on to their kids. Why is our fund broke? Because we're not fulfilling our obligations. We're not managing it well. And I, I, and that's one of the things where if we need to look at that in order to help uh, address the fact that, Hey, look, we're looking at bankruptcy soon, what have you, mm -hmm. I'm with you. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's hard sell to tell me that changing up the benefits is the problem and not that the state just can't manage its money well. Sure. Very good. Uh, we are running out of time. A couple of questions I'd like to squeeze in here yet. Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment is thou shall not speak ill of a fellow Republican. What's your philosophy on negative campaigning in a primary? Yeah, so I think there's items that are obviously very on limits and then off limits. I mean, um, every single voter deserves to be informed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's no way that, um, for example, one of my opponents is going to come out and say, hey, yeah, I, I, I said Hillary Clinton should be elected for president. Something he said. Mm -hmm. He's not going to come out and say that. Mm -hmm. But voters deserve to know because, of course, every candidate is trying to put forward only them best selves, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's on limit items. And that would be something like saying or, or supporting Hillary Clinton in 2016, um, you know, creating uh, a, a, a racial activism group, anti racism KY, like one of my opponents did. Mm -hmm. That is a political actions, mm -hmm. but then there's off limit items. Mm -hmm. Don't attack somebody's wife. Don't attack their family. Don't don't, don't go into the mud. Mm -hmm. Deal with political issues, and also too, don't don't get into hyperbole. Um, you know, state what they did factually, and and you don't need to uh, super expand that out. Um, don't try to take one thing and blow it up. And then me personally too as well. You know, when I I try to be as understanding with someone where they're at, right? So so you know, if if. One off comment, my my one opponent who you know, has a lot of negative things had just said in a one off thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that uh, white people are implicitly biased mm -hmm. and one off. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even bring it up. It was a one off one time comment. And, and I try to show grace in that way. Mm -hmm. When you create an organization that literally pushes that forward. When you create a management consulting company to manage on diversity, equity, inclusion, when you host a, a diversity, equity, inclusion summit two weeks before declaring for office, that's not a one-off thing. And it's also important information voters deserve to know. Um, and, and also too, I think we got to understand what Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment deals with, which is more so talking about um, I, I believe he's talking about Republicans that are our nominee at that point. Don't, Degregate your the, your Republican nominee in another office uh, while you're in the middle of elections and things like that. Um, but you know, primaries are naturally about compare and contrast. Sure. So compare and contrast yourself fairly, fair items. But 
don't cross the line. Don't go into family. Don't go into personal issues. Sure. Don't go into those kinds of things. Sure. Uh, one more question here. We're going to try to squeeze in. Uh, if you were elected to the treasurer position, what kind of people would you surround yourself with in an advisory capacity or in personnel in your department? So what kind of character traits do you look for? Mm -hmm. What kind of experience do you look for? Tell us the kind of people you would fill that office with. Yeah, so um, number one is I'm looking for people who understand the mission and have the same values mm -hmm. as I do, um, the, the same conservative values, because we want to keep ourselves on the path moving forward. I mean, it's, you know, people call it a lot of things, shiny mm -hmm. object syndrome, something like that, where mm -hmm. politicians get distracted away from what they're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. um, because they want to feel special or fancy or what have you. So people to keep on a straight and narrow, but also to people as well who are not political climbers, mm -hmm. people who are there because they want to serve the people, they want to move forward these items, not because they're looking to run for another office. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's incredibly important because like I said, if we're are we trying to accomplish things? Are we trying to create headlines and political hits? Mm -hmm. If we're trying to accomplish things, you want people who are motivated to get things done, but not motivated to forward themselves. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to get in political hits and headlines, well, then you want only people who want to forward themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's incredibly important. So, uh, um, you know, people who have the, the conservative values, um, people who are not politically motivated, but are motivated by doing the right thing. And, and obviously as well, people you can trust. So people that you know well, um, where, and, and they know that they can talk to you. They can, they can, um, they don't have to worry about offending you. They, they are able to openly speak with you. You can openly speak with them where you have that kind of back and forth. Very good. Andrew Cooperwriter, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us and best wishes to you on the campaign trail. Thank you so much.